Welcome to the best of the Leon Charney Report. For over two decades, Leon Charney, one of the architects of the historic Camp David Peace Accords, has interviewed some of the most important figures in modern day history. These interviews provide a window into some of the most significant events of the last 50 years. In this excerpt, recorded in May of 1990, Leon Charney speaks with Abba Iban, the former Israeli ambassador to the UN, who talks about Israeli politics and peace. Today we are honored to have with us Ambassador Abba Iban, in my opinion, the most celebrated political figure of the last 40 years to come from the state of Israel. That includes Moshe Dayan and Ben-Gurion now. You may get a little upset about that, but uh, if you ask any Jew around the world, who they would like to hear most from, it's Abba Ivan. Maybe in Israel it's always not that way, but I know wherever I go, everybody says Abba Ivan. And for the last, it doesn't seem that Abba Ivan is more than 40 years old, but he's, he's been with the state of Israel as its first ambassador in Washington. Anyway, welcome, Mr. Ivan, Ambassador Ivan. Well, thank you very much for your very objective words. <laughs> I'm like Henry Kissinger. <laughs> I'm subjective. Uh, today, a uh, report from Syria that uh, Mubarak, the president of Egypt met with uh, President Assad first time. Uh, Mubarak has visited Syria in a long time since Camp David. And they speak very, uh, in a sense, very toughly about uh, what to do with Israel. Israel is now a common enemy. Do you see any political ramifications? Firstly, Husni Mubarak is a very successful statesman. He inherited an Egypt that was scorched earth. No relations with any of the Arab states, expelled from the Arab League, expelled from the Organization of African Unity, expelled from the non-aligned countries. Now everybody's back in Cairo. All the Arab ambassadors are back while the Israeli flag flies in Cairo. He's president of the Organization of African Unity. He's a centerpiece in the peace process. He has a, an alliance with the United States. He has renewed relations with the Soviet Union. So he's a very constructive and dynamic force, less flamboyant than Sadat, but in my opinion, more successful. Now. Uh, this statement about Israel is very largely a response to the extraordinary period that we're living in Israeli policy. For the first time in its history, Israel is refusing dialogue, not simply turning down proposals in a dialogue, refusing to enter a dialogue and to explore whether the peace prospect is available. At this time, Israel is putting its uh, claim to 100% of the territory and 100% of the sovereignty in the whole of the area between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. I testify as the last central figure in that drama that if we had asked for 100% of the territory and sovereignty, no country would have recognized our legitimacy and the world would have organized successfully to prevent our emergence. We have always had a policy of respect for the holy places. And here we have these settlers bursting in with guns on the holy day, destroying 800 years of serenity in the Christian high place, holy places, and Prime Minister uh, Shamir says, any Jew can live exactly where he likes. But if he says that, is he also going to say every Arab can live where he likes? Could armed Arabs come within a few yards of the Wailing Wall and start establishing a settlement? It's nonsense. There's a special status for the holy places recognized in our Declaration of Independence. All of this together, contemptuous remarks about the United States, rejection of the Baker Initiative, and now the creation of a government which will be dominated by the forces of irredentism and the proponents of violence. And that is what has led to a world reaction, a world reaction, an American reaction. I've never known the United States in greater reserve and indignation. And of course, it, it, the Arabs react as well, and even more deliberately. But on the whole, I think um, Mubarak will not ally himself with anything to do with war against Israel. Moreover, when um, President Assad says to somebody, not just somebody, but the former President of the United States, President, the principal, Carter. Um, President Carter, whom I spoke to about this last week, I'm willing to discuss peace with Israel, the least that a lucid and rational government can do would be to explore. It may not be anything. I find it intolerable to see that our nation refuses to explore in case, heaven forbid, the prospect of peace should emerge. Now, so long as we have a policy of refusing to explore, claiming 100% of the territory and sovereignty, ignoring the immunity of the holy places, we're not going to be popular anywhere, not only in the Arab world, but anywhere at all. Therefore, we're in a very deep confusion about our, our structure and our values and our political system is paralyzed. 
Mr. Shami had lost the confidence of the Knesset and hasn't regained it, and yet he sees himself as entitled to create new and dangerous realities. This is a very bad period in our country's life. I can only hope that we have the resilience and the good sense with which uh, to emerge by the strength of public opinion calling for change. This must bring tremendous heartbreak to you. I mean, we just celebrated Israel's 42nd anniversary. You were one of the founding fathers of the State of Israel. You sat with Harry Truman and had him declare that uh, the State of Israel should be born. Uh, what happens to you emotionally in 42 years? How do you feel today? This is not a, a moment of satisfaction. I'm now uh, trying to make a television series which will evoke again uh, the um, atmosphere of the early years when we were young and it was morning and it was good to be alive and when almost everything seemed open before us and although progress is usually regarded as looking forward for Israel progress would be looking backward to the conditions which made our sudden emergence feasible to the period when Israel was the center of world admiration to try to recover the lucid visionary attitude of pragmatism and compromise and to understand that in the modern world those who say all or nothing are much more likely to get nothing than to get all. I can only hope that the very intensity of this crisis, and it's very intense domestically, internationally, regionally, will bring about a new kind of surge of conscience and that uh, from the people themselves there will come a demand not to put up with that kind of leadership. Do you see Israel becoming very right-wing now, sort of Khomeini-ish? Israel isn't right-wing. On the contrary, there was a, a poll in Israel about a week ago uh, which said that about 54% of our nation would welcome a concession, a compromise on territory, and that 23 of them would even give up the whole of the West Bank. But um, that's the situation. Um, in other words, the composition in Parliament does not reflect that's a right. public consensus because the religious parties, most of whom are against annexation and permanent Israeli rule, base their decisions on something quite extraneous, on how many yeshivot they will have and on how they can legislate for the humiliation of American Jews. There is a strong uh, infrastructure of lucid, visionary, moderate, realistic and pragmatic thinking, but you need leadership to bring that to expression. Uh, but, but even if the polls are bad, after all, the polls have never been good. In the olden times, the Jews were all against the Ten Commandments and in favor of the Golden Calf, but then we had leadership. Mr. Ambassador, could a dark horse like Azer Weitzman uh, run for, I mean, obviously he could run, but could he uh, fall in as uh, head of the Labour Party now? Is there enough support for a person like that? My own reading of the situation is that it's uh, not very likely. Nevertheless, if he were to take my advice, I would advise him to run. You cannot lose anything. Sometimes you can be surprised. It's not just a question of winning, which may not be feasible, but if there is a body of opinion based upon what I would call a healthy obsession with the peace idea, by being a candidate you get a platform for those ideas and that's just as important as winning office. I made a mistake in 1974 when uh, Rabin and uh, Perez were suggested. I didn't believe they had greater qualifications than myself, either intellectual or international or diplomatic or any other. But my friend at the time, Mr. Sapir, said that they're so solidly entrenched you will only get 25% and I yielded, I now realize that it's ridiculous. What do you mean only 25%? With 25% in our kind of parties, You're a stakeholder. You, can, uh, you can really achieve a certain basis that was wrong. Why, why, not, why not try? At least there should be somebody around whom those who believe that the achievement of peace is possible and urgent should have somebody around whom they can express that conviction. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. The preceding program was brought to you by Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace.